Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Caitlin Today. I'm Caitlin Alley, and I will be your host. Today, we will have three guests. Ben Muller, who is one of Windsor's very own up-and-coming musicians, Amber Johnson, an aspiring fashion designer, and MacArthur Starks, a competing drag racer at the New England Dragway in Epping, New Hampshire. First, we will have Ben Muller, who will be talking about his music career and his new album, Seemingly Meaningless Contradictions. Hello, Ben. So, Ben, can you tell us what is your style of music? When people ask me uh, what style of music I play, I usually just say acoustic ukulele music, but mm -hmm. I take um, elements from indie and pop and rock and uh, a little bit of reggae. <laughs> I just mix it up all the time. It's not very consistent with one genre. How long have you been interested in music? Um, let's see. I've always liked music, but I wasn't really interested in playing it until I was about 11 or 12. And then I really started to decide, like, I, I would like to be a musician when I grow up. Mm -hmm. That was my, that was my, like, when I first got the idea that I wanted to do it for, like, relatively the rest of my life. So how long have you been playing the ukulele? About two years, I believe. I know you play a handful of instruments from when to string to percussion. Can you list a few that are your favorite? Um, the ukulele is definitely up there. Um, I'm also a drummer. That's my other big instrument. Mm -hmm. And I must say that you're not always in the mood to bang on stuff <laughs> and make loud noise right. and scare your neighbors. But I'm always in the mood to sit down and play the ukulele mm -hmm. and sing a song. It, it just makes me happy. Um, so I know that you have recently released a digital album called Seemingly Meaningless Contradictions. It's true. Can you tell the viewers a little bit about it? Well, um, I recorded the whole album mm -hmm. in my house wow. by myself. <laughs> um, it was either recorded in my bedroom or in my basement. And I played, I played every instrument on the album because I didn't have anyone to uh, play <laughs> anything else. So I, I played all of the instruments, uh, sang every track of vocals, and I did it with a tiny little USB microphone and a 10-year-old laptop that was really, really slow. <laughs> and so it came out a lot better than I expected it would come out. And so it was uh, the most rewarding thing I've done this summer, I right. think. It, it was really frustrating at times, but it worked out really well. On your album, there is a song that you wrote called Mama. What inspired you to write this? Well, a lot of times artists will take inspiration from what happened in their life. Mm -hmm. I don't really do that at all. <laughs> One day I was playing around on the ukulele and I, this idea popped into my head. Mm -hmm. The first line of the song just came to me. It happens to me a lot when yeah. I write songs. And it's a story basically about a mother, obviously, and her teenage son yeah. and the son is not a very nice guy oh. and he he's your your epitome of a delinquent teenager right. and he does everything she doesn't want him to do and he doesn't care he doesn't care how she feels about it and he convinces her every time that he does something wrong I won't do it again though, I promise <laughs> but he does and this it ends on the same line that it starts on uh -huh. so it's an endless cycle of just teenage delinquency. And I have a very, very good relationship with my mother. That's good. I'm kind of a mama's boy. So I don't, I don't, it doesn't apply to my life at all. But I just thought it was a good story to tell. It happens a lot to me. Because my life isn't really that interesting. I don't have tons of, you know, inspirational things happen to me in my life. Right. And so I think of stories and write about that. So I recall when you and a friend of yours, Seamus Coleman, entered Windsor's Got Talent as Feed the Animals, a two-man comedic band. And the both of you won first place, correct? This is true. So, tell us, do you think that that experience helped you to further your music career? Uh, yeah, I definitely think that it helped. Uh, before Wings Has Got Talent, I had never played the ukulele, or sang, or performed my own material in front of a large audience. And that was, it seemed like 
I guess, from watching the footage that I had done it before, but I really hadn't. And it was a really, really good learning experience um, because I learned how to deal with nerves. Right. I learned that I could sing. I didn't know that I could sing until Seamus and I started Feed the Animals. And he was like, dude, you can actually sing. <laughs> I was like, whoa, I didn't know that. And so it's definitely very, very, uh, very, very large like impact on my musical career, if you will, because I don't know if I would have even started or continuing uh, writing songs after that, because I, I didn't know I could sing. I didn't know I could write songs. Well, I can, apparently. And so it really started a, a love of like writing my own material in, in me and mm -hmm. music. What happened when you won? Well, the prize was $1,000 and the recording session. It was like five hours or something like that. <laughs> um, Seamus got 500 and I got 500 and <laughs> we split it. Um, but we got to go to the studio in Rocky Hill, um, work with this guy, Matt Berkey, mm -hmm. who had uh, lived in Windsor. Uh, and he, he's a recording artist, or recording engineer now. And he does, usually does like audio for commercials and stuff. Right. And uh, monologues. Because you know, there's a lot of audio that goes into commercials that you don't even think about. Right. But um, we got to go record a couple of our songs, mm -hmm. our really silly, just senseless <laughs> comedy songs with, with this guy, Matt. And he, he really, really, really knew what he was doing. Our songs came out really well. We put them up on mine and everybody loved them. And uh, I learned a lot and so did Seamus. And it was a really good experience. What else can we expect from you? Uh, I would like to continue playing little acoustic shows here and there around town mostly. And uh, this year, I'm probably going to try to record a full length album rather than a partial one, you know, maybe 11 or 12 songs rather than five. And that's pretty much all I have planned for the near future. Well, then, thank you for taking the time for this interview. Thank you. We're back with Now in Trend. Another one of our guests today is Amber Johnson. Today, she'll be showing us some of the best back to school styles. So, Amber, can you tell us what we have today? Thanks for having me on your show, Caitlin. This is my first model, Candace, and she's wearing a vintage outfit. The oversized sweatshirt is from a thrift shop, which is a great place to find vintage clothing. Really? And she has a black cami underneath because of the knit material. As for shoes, she's wearing a pair of brown leather Oxford booties, mm -hmm. which are also from a thrift shop. And when you wear a vintage outfit, you want to try and add a piece that's more modern to it okay. so it's not too vintage. So I added a pair of fitted skinny jeans in this nice raspberry color. And it has a nice contrast with the white sweater. Now when you're wearing something like this, should you wear red colored clothing, like red colored jeans, or can you wear another color like yellow? Or you green? can wear any color you want really, but you want to try and stick with a darker color for jeans if you're going to wear a light color at top, because if you wore like white and yellow, mm -hmm. it would be too light and it wouldn't, it would kind of clash. Okay. So you want to try and go darker. And then I added some jewelry. So whenever I think vintage, I think floral. Right. So I added these daisies on so I added this daisy ring and rose earrings in a nice cream color. And since the ring is gold, I added a tiered heart gold necklace. So who do we have next? Next we have Kyle, who's showing you a casual outfit for guys. Mm -hmm. We started out with a button-up shirt, just red and white and a little bit of blue. Mm -hmm. And we added a pair of dark wash jeans. These are nice and casual, and you can see the fading on them. Right. And then for shoes, we went with a white pair of sneakers that have red detailing, mm -hmm. since there is red in the shirt. Right. And then as for accessories, we added a silver band, and it has a little bit of gold, and it just kind of brings a nice accessory to a casual outfit. Right. So is this better as a summer outfit, or it's also good during the school year? It's good during the school year when you're going from summer to fall, the kind of transition period when you want to wear something warm enough right. but not too hot. So that's why we rolled up the sleeves, and it also gives it a nice casual feel. You have an outfit that you can show us today, right? 
Yes. So this outfit is actually a bit edgier mm -hmm. than all the other ones that I picked out just for my edgier people out mm -hmm. there. And I started with a pair of high-waisted leather shorts, because mm -hmm. this is basically the epitome of edgy. Right. And I paired it with a pair of leather wedge boots with peep toes. Right. And since I have black and black, I decided to bring a little bit of black into the top with mm -hmm. this sheer blouse. It's nice and sleeveless, so when you're in school, it's not too hot. And I just have a cami underneath, so mm -hmm. it's not too risque. And this is a cheetah print, which is great for this season since prints are really in right now. Mm -hmm. And especially prints on prints, like mixing two different prints, like right. stripes and floral mm -hmm. in one outfit. That's really trendy right now. And then I paired it with some jewelry, and I just went with a simple gold ring right. and a black bracelet just to match the black in the outfit. And then triangle earrings that have black and gold, because black and gold. And then for lipstick, I went with a bright orange because this season, another trend is color blocking, right. which is basically getting solid colors and incorporating it into your outfit. Mm -hmm. So any solid colored lipstick is really trendy right now. So it doesn't have to match the outfit. It doesn't have to match, but it has to not clash with it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, in your glasses, um, are they part of the outfit? They do work with the outfit, but these are actually prescription glasses, so I wear these to see. But <laughs> if you want to wear a pair of glasses as accessories, they mm -hmm. have ones with clear lenses, so it won't change your vision, but it will be a nice accessory. Awesome. So we have another outfit to show you, Kyle. So what is Kyle wearing? Kyle has on a preppier outfit. So we started out with a red and white pinstripe shirt. And to pull out a bit of the red from the shirt, we added red boat shoes, which are also nice and preppy and go with the outfit. Mm -hmm. And as for pants, we went with a pair of khaki pants and a tan belt, because the tan goes with the pants, and we didn't want to add anything darker to like overshadow the shirt. Right. And then as for his accessories, he has on his silver man band. <laughs> <laughs> and where can he wear this outfit, you say? He can wear this outfit anywhere where you'd want to dress up, but not too much, such right. as church or if you go to a preppy school mm -hmm. or if you just really love the preppy style. Right. Wow. Thank you, Kyle. Now, Amber selected my outfit today. Um, can you tell the viewers a little bit about it? Sure. So, Caitlin has on a preppy outfit, too, just so you can see a girl version and a boy version. So, we started out with a crew neck shirt in just a basic brown. And to add a little bit of flair to the shirt, we added a button-up blue one underneath, and it has a nice collar peeking through, and we cuffed the sleeves just to add a little bit more blue. And then as far as pants goes, we went with another pair of khaki pants, because that's always great for any preppy outfit. And boat shoes are an essential if you're trying to dress preppy. And the plaid on this really goes well with the blue in the shirt and it brings out the lighter blue in the shoes. And if you notice on the shoes, there's also a bit of red, so we pulled that out through accessories. We added a red necklace and a red watch. Thank you, Amber, for dressing me today. Anytime. Now, I wanted to ask you a few questions. Um, one of them is gonna be about your style, so can you tell me what inspires you to create outfits such as these? Well, as silly as it sounds, Tumblr actually inspires me. You're familiar with Tumblr, right? Yeah. Yeah, so Tumblr is a microblogging site, and people post a lot of fashion stuff, like different outfits, shoes, and anything that they, like, pair up themselves. Mm -hmm. So I go on Tumblr a lot, and I see other people's style, and it kind of, I'll, like, pick and choose stuff from mm -hmm. their outfits that I like to wear myself and kind of mold my style from that right. so that's one big inspiration now do you take pictures of your clothing and then you put them on tumblr or? i do but most of the time i spend when i'm doing my blogging stuff mm -hmm. i do videos of my outfits right. so i'll film a video and edit it and then put it on youtube so it's like a little show that i'm doing and then i'll also add pictures to my site mm -hmm. so I usually post them on Tumblr after, but right. YouTube's my main thing. So, Amber has a blog called superbeautyguru.com. Can you tell us a little bit about your blog? 
Yeah, so I started it last November, mm -hmm. and it's just a beauty and fashion site where I show my own personal style, and I show like tutorials on how I do different makeup looks or nail looks. Mm -hmm. So I mostly do tutorials to show other people how to do something, since there's a lot of people out there who don't know how, and they tend to ask me how I do different nail designs. Right. So it helps them out, and it's fun to do. And I was looking on your blog. I saw that you had an interesting section called hauls. What are those? Okay, so I get this question a lot. Hauls are basically videos or blog posts people do when after they go shopping, they have a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. and people are really interested in seeing what other people are buying. Right. So if I go shopping and I buy like some new, new clothes or shoes or something, mm -hmm. and I think my viewers will be interested in what I'm getting, right. I'll do a little video showing what I got and telling the prices because I tend to look for really good deals. Right. So if I find a good deal, then other people will probably benefit from knowing about it. Right. And people like watching them. So sales. Yeah, right? sales. Mm -hmm. And would you find these at retail stores? Uh, I find these at retail stores, thrift shops, mm -hmm. malls, outlets, basically anywhere that they sell clothes. Wow. Thank you so much, Amber, for joining us on Caitlin Today. Thank you for having me, Caitlin. And here are the lovely Candace and the handsome Kyle. Now on to our last segment, telling about a man living life in the fast lane. Behind the wheel of that red Camaro is Drag Racer MacArthur Starks. I'm here with him today at Lebanon Valley Raceway in upstate New York. Hello, MacArthur. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. First off, I'm sure that almost everyone wants to know what kind of car you race. Excellent. Can you tell us a little bit about it? This is a 1967 Camaro, but it's not, it wasn't built in 1967. The car is a full chassis car, so the car was actually built in 1994, and it was then updated in 2007 to the way it looks now. That you have decals on the car. Do they signify anything? Sure. They're called contingency decals. What that means is when you buy a product, okay. if you win with those decals on the car, the manufacturer will pay you for running the decal on your car and running the product. So that's why they call it a contingency decal. You'll get paid, continue to bond, you're actually winning a race. There are a lot of people who watch these races and believe that the fastest car wins. Is this always true? Well, it, it is. So when you watch on TV, they typically show the pros. So with the pros, you know, they're sponsored by Budweiser and a lot of the big companies. So they have a lot of money to throw at, at those cars. So in those types of races, the first one to the finish line does win. In the style of racing that I do, it's called a handicap racing. So what that means is, in my class, my entire class is 990. So 9.90 seconds in a quarter of a mile. So for me, if I go faster than 9.90 seconds, and my competitor doesn't go faster, then I lose. So, so they have that. They call that handicapping it. So, if we both go too fast, then the one that go, goes too fast by more loses. So, and again, so and the reason why you know there are other styles of handicap racing also. There, I run a 990 class. There's a 1090 class. There's a there's a 890 class. Then there's a, a bracket racing class, which is you can dial whatever you want to dial. You don't have to be all just governed by one number, like 990 for, per se. You just run as fast as you can, but you're, you're on that index. And you're on your own index. And, and the reason why they have that, again, is because if you put $10,000 in your car and I put $5,000 in my car, then you're going to probably beat me most of the time. And I'm not going to get too happy about that. So I'm not going to waste my money and come to the track and race. So, so what they did was they started handicapping it. So now it doesn't matter. You're going to go faster than me, and I, re I know that, but I can just dial a slower number. As long as I run my number, I can still be compete with you. So, these are definitely not street legal. <laughs> no, definitely not street legal. No. <laughs> It'd be interesting, but it wouldn't be street legal. No. How often do you race? 
probably averages out to about every other weekend. I mean, I'll, I'll go sometimes three weeks without racing, but then I'll race three weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. but I think, you know, from April through October, it's about every other weekend. So there's a season? Yeah, there's a season. And it, the Northeast, because obviously Mother Nature isn't too kind to us, mm -hmm. you know, between October and, and March, right. my racing season goes from April through the beginning, beginning of October. Right. What you have to watch out for is when it starts to get cool, the tracks sometimes get slick, and the faster you are, sometimes the car kind of get out of shape. So you got to be careful with that, with the car. And then when it's too cold out physically, you know, who wants to stand out in the cold, right? <laughs> so you'd rather be racing when it's a nice day like today, where it's in the 70s. Sometimes you race when it's in the 90s, but that kind of gets kind of brutal. But, um, but yeah, so the racing season for me goes from April through the beginning of October. So what kind of clothing is required in the car? Well, as you can see, you know, when it, for any car that's faster than 9.99 in a quarter of a mile, so 9.99 seconds, you're required to wear a fire suit, right? So you have to wear a jacket like this, the fire pants. I'm wearing boots, um, lightweight boots that are fire retardant. Um, you have to wear a helmet, and I, I wear a Hans device also, and you have to wear gloves, right? So again, when you figure it's 90 degrees and you're wearing all this equipment, it's not too comfortable. <laughs> How long have you been racing? Interesting. So, this is my 18th year driving, wow. and I, my father got me into racing, and I started racing with with him when we had the car built in 1994. He he raced the first year, and then I've been driving the car ever since. So, how did you first become interested in the sport? Well, interesting. So, I, I say it's in the blood, <laughs> and, and literally, I mean, so so it goes back to my father. So, my my father raced at this track here here in, in Lebanon Valley, New York, back when I was a little guy. You know, so I remember going to a track at four years old, right? And then he got out of it and then he, he got back into it with another guy back when I was graduating college. And I started to come with them, just kind of watching. My father was driving and they, those two guys were partners. And, they, and the other guy, his name was Mac also. So my father was Mac, MacArthur Stark Sr. The other guy's name was Mac. So that's where the name Mac Attack came from. <laughs> And then in 1994, my father and I decided to just do our own thing and have this car built. And we decided that, you know, we'll just keep the Mac Attack name. Since I'm a Mac Junior, he's a Mac Senior. And it seemed to just work well because everybody at that time knew who we were. You know, so, so I really got into racing because of my dad. So I, I, I asked my father, well, how did you get into racing? And it's interesting, so he said he was, in, he was in high school one day and he saw a racing ma hot rod magazine in school. And what he did was he flipped through the magazine, and then next thing you know, here I am, you know, 40 years later, racing, you know, because he picked up a Hot Rod magazine. Now, if he had picked up a, I don't know, an airplane magazine, who knows? Do you, or have you had a crew that helps you prepare your car before racing? Yeah, so, so my father and I raced together, uh, again, until 2010, where unfortunately my dad passed away. So it was always my father and I racing. You know, so now that my father's no longer here, obviously, so now I'm on my own with the car. So I do all the all the maintenance on the car myself. But when I have an engine problem, I take the motor out and bring it to my engine guy. If I have a chassis issue, something needs to be done with the car, I bring it to another guy. I have, you know, my transmission. If I got something need something there, I have guys who work on my transmission. So, but I put it all back together and maintain the car myself. And does your racing partner Frank? Is well, interesting, you know, so I would say Frank's my partner today because we just happened to be, he was available, he was available to come up and he runs the same class I run. So we were able to test together. So, so we weren't we aren't necessarily partners in, in terms of racing together, but we just happened to be available today, both of us, and able to come to the track today. So I would say today he's my partner, but normally he's my competitor, so I could race him in a race. And at that point, we're friends at the, here and we're friends everywhere but on the track. Going down the track, it's, you know, every man or woman for himself. Do you plan on continuing to race at this level, or would you like to advance to the next one? And can you tell us about what that next level would be? Yeah, interesting question. So, the, the levels in drag racing are, are kind of interesting. So you have the pros, and I guess you would consider that to be the, the, the upper echelon of the sport. But what I like to do, I like this type of racing. So, so when you ask the question, do, 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 do I want to do something different? No, I actually like throttle stop racing, run 990. You know, so if you said to me, well, what, what class would you want to run next? I mean, there's a top sportsman class. That's a, again, that's a bracket. You go as fast as you can. And those cars are running the six second range, you know. I mean, I, I, mean that, I like to watch that, but you know, I, I tend to, 
like the throttle stop racing like this, but for me, it's more of a challenge because the car has to react off the Christmas tree or the starting line fast. You have to react fast. The car has to react track fast. And it's a race all the way down the track as opposed to me just dialing a, you know, a number and I'm going out there by myself until we get to the finish line. So for this, for me, at least, it's, it, I'm more motivated by the entire way down the track I'm racing someone as opposed to just racing them just at the finish line. Do you consider this to be a hobby or is it much more than that to you? Well, yeah, it's a hobby but much more. So it's kind of, it's kind of both. So um, again, it, it, it's in the, blood, in the blood. So for me, it's almost like, man, you, you wake up and it's just part of me. You know, I've been doing it, I've been doing it so long. So yes, it's a hobby because I don't make a living at this. You know, and the, the, the joke is, if you want to be a millionaire in drag racing, start off as a multi-millionaire, right? So, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's true, you know, but I mean, I consider it to be a hobby, you know, and I do it as, you know, as, as, um, in terms of expense, I do as much as I can with it, you know, I mean, some guys I, you know, race with, I mean, they're racing all year long, you know, there's, there's some guys, all they do is race, you know, some guys like me, they got a day job, and do this on the weekends, you know, but, um, but for me, you know, it, it, again, it's, it, it's a hobby, but it, it's, as you can see, I mean, there's a, there's a lot more to it than just like, you know, a, a normal hobby. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with viewers? Sure. You know, I, I, I guess, you know, for me, you know, the, the racing thing is, is, is a passion. Like I said, it's in the blood, you know, so, you know, so you might look at this and say, you know, you go to the track, you know, you make a pass, you come back, you wait, you make another pass, you know, is that really fun? And I would say, you know, for me personally, it would be fun. So what I would say is, you know, going fast for me, is nice, but what, what gets my adrenaline going is more than just going fast. For me, it's, it's being competitive. It's so it's that competitive fire in me that brings me out to do something that I love to do. So I would, I guess, I just reach out to say, you know, thank you. It's been it's been nice, you know, talking with you and meeting you. This is this is this is uh, great to see you and your family, and meeting you, a wonderful family, We're coming out to the track here. Mother Nature blesses us with a great day, and there's nothing better to be at the track with nice sunshine on, on us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Ben Muller will be closing with a new song from his album, Mama. For more information on today's guests, be sure to visit my website. And thank you for watching Caitlin Today. Tune in next time. Can you teach me how to doggy even though I can't dance? Can you give me just another chance? Can you live with me a little longer and you will see that the me you see is not really me.